Just cast. Network. My bitches start kicking ass just like it said at the beginning of the program. Man of the hour. Tower of power. Too sweet to be sour. Sending your ass on the jabroni jet to the other side of the territory, brother. The Alabama Hammer. Nightmares on the best part of my day. The goods from the woods. Hot damn. You're entering a world, not of sight, but of sound and mind. It's the goods from the woods. We're talking science fiction today. My name is Rivers Langley. I'm Pat. This is going to man of the hour, tower of power, too sweet to be sour. You know what they're calling this uh, broadcast podcast these days? What's that? They're calling it the number one podcast in Auburn, Alabama. Oh, well, yeah. Well, that's that goes without saying. Because that's what it is. You the number one podcast in Zimbabwe, too. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, we're going for probably Nigeria yeah. as well. And, Mozambique. And Mozambique. We're like trying to get Bill and song. We're trying to get our numbers up in Canada. Really? Yeah. I didn't know we had a Canadian song. And we're going to and we're gonna do it with this guest today. We're going to do it because he is uh, Canada adjacent from uh, Fargo, North Dakota, our guest. Luke Jensen, that's right, North Dakota, Canada's uh, sewer, as it's commonly referred to. <laughs> Today we're, uh, we're going into hyperspace. How's that grab you, Pat? Not at all. <laughs> Remember an asteroid, you could hit the hyperspace button and you'd just rematerialize somewhere else to be instantly squashed by another asteroid. See, I would prefer if we talked about asteroids. But hey, we, talking... can, we, can, we, can, uh, we can talk about asteroids. No, you, yeah. you can do your thing. Hemorrhoids. Go ahead. It's <laughs> asteroids. I feel yeah. like this is my fault because there's basically two things I could talk all day about and one of them is Star Wars and the other is basketball. So that's either going to ice out Rivers on basketball or Pat completely on Star Wars. Yeah, so. and and the thing is, is that we're River- talking about hemorrhoids. <laughs> Rivers, I know hemorrhoids. Uh, okay, does Roid rage apply to hemorrhoids? I think so. I think so. It should. It should. Um, Rivers runs the show, so ice me out. Uh, we'll we'll figure something out we'll for you to talk about, out. buddy. Good do you like the data. Do you like the Twilight Zone? Hands. Yeah, Twilight Zone's pretty good. Hands yeah. touching hands, you understand? My hand touching your hand. The love that I was given, <laughs> I will repay, because I will be the next world champion of this hard time blues. Let's get right into Star Wars. Watched it uh, probably a thousand times when I was a kid. Yeah. Definitely my favorite movie. Uh, just rewatched A New Hope uh, in preparation for this podcast here. See, Luke... Luke did homework, Pat. Yeah. You can't watch the fucking thing once. <laughs> I've never seen Star Wars it, ever. It, at this point, you know, I think this makes Pat like a museum piece because he is a, <laughs> a, 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 a heterosexual man. You understand? <laughs> who was born back in the day? Who has not seen Star Wars? And that's kind of impressive. It's not like a thing where I was trying to actively avoid Star Wars. It's, it's not like you, one of you accidentally avoided it, and now it's become like a, yeah. A sticking so point. here's the thing: when I was a kid. They never had Star Wars on cable. Like, Star Wars wasn't played on cable very frequently. So that axed out basically a large portion of my opportunities to see Star Wars. Also, my father had seen Star Wars, and he hated it. He thought it was the dumbest thing ever. So we didn't have the tapes. So without the tapes and it being played on cable frequently, I had no opportunities to really watch it. And as I got older, I picked up bits and pieces of right. of the pl- of the plot. So essentially, I can't get into it on a plot level. And then, you know, well, special nobody effects. Nobody gets into it on a plot level. I, I, I figured <laughs> as such. I'm I'm sorry for being so art house. Um, <laughs> but I and also the special effects have become so antiquated that I know See, what happened. Whoa, I just dis- I disagree. I disagree. I, Damn they, proper special effects before they start doing everything by computer is right. the real. Special I think it effects. looks better. It I looks agree. better than most of the shit that comes out now. It's kind of the, the the original unedited theatrical versions are way better than like the digitally enhanced ones oh, that they released. Yeah. He, he scribbled. He took a dump on them fucking things oh, when he made God. them special edition. That was the beginning of when Star Wars started to suck. Oh, yeah. when he yep. made them special yeah. edition. Uh, you know what gets me about the special editions and the prequels? 
There was a t- nowadays people are like, oh, I'm a nerd. I like Star Wars. When I was growing up, you were a nerd if you didn't like Star Wars because yeah. only losers and girls didn't like Star Wars. <laughs> and when you when you're ten years old, what's the difference? <laughs> and seriously, and if you go back to even the mid nineties, Lucas people would throw the words Lucas and genius around, and they weren't even kidding. Yeah, he survived Howard the Duck. Yeah, and then they made them fucking hey, special hey, editions. Hey, Howard the Duck is great. Oh, Howard the Duck ain't too bad. That's science fiction. We can talk Howard the Duck no, yeah, if you want. That's not. <laughs> George Lucas presents an electrifying new comedy, Howard the Duck. More adventure than humanly possible. But well, why would we? Uh, what the hell was I saying about Star Wars? We were talking about... Oh, yeah, his- Lucas took a dump on his own legacy when yeah. he made them special editions. They, they were like the foreshadowing that the prequels was going to be ass shit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 he, and says, there was a time when if you said you didn't like Star Wars, you would get a boot in the balls. <laughs> and you deserved it. Now, if you say you don't like Star Wars, you, you know, Jaws ain't my scene and I don't, I don't like, like Star, Star Wars. Wars. Exactly. Yeah, that's the only thing I have against Freddie Mercury. Freddie no. Mercury was lying, too, because I can show you a picture of him sitting on the shoulders of a guy in a Darth Vader costume on stage. <laughs> and I was like, I thought, I, thought, I thought you don't like Star Wars, Freddie Mercury. It might have been Brian May or somebody brought him on. You know, well, like May was the one behind it. Well, Brian May is actually like an astronomer. Yeah, or he's a, he's got a PhD in astronomy. Yeah. I, as much as I love Jurassic Park, George Lucas was quoted as saying uh, when he saw Jurassic Park, he knew it was time to make the prequels because technology had caught up with his vision. But he ignored the lesson of that movie, which is the reason that Jurassic Park still looks better than the Star Wars movies that came out ten years later, is because Steven Spielberg actually had, took the time, went locations, and got actual puppets, like did the close-ups. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Did everything he possibly could up to the point of needing that new technology. Well, I remember too when I got to say when Jurassic Park came out, it was it was like. You know, we didn't know everything about like what you could do with computer graphics then. Right. So I remember seeing that, and I was like, "How in the hell did they do this?" Yeah, yeah, changed my life. That man. was Luke. First how how old were you the first time you seen Star Wars? That's what I just asked. Yeah, I don't know. Probably before I can remember. Oh, Jesus. yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you we my my parents it. liked it, so so we had like the tapes and everything. That I don't know, they taped it off something because it wasn't like you know an official tape. It was just like a whatever Magnavox or whatever <laughs> tape that they just taped over probably like some of my baby videos or (laughs) like their own wedding or something i'm sure my dad would do that but that's like a a singular experience i don't think kids are having which is just going through unlabeled tapes trying desperately to find the one that you you i I used to have a a, 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 um was it empire strikes back taped off like a tv broadcast yeah and the most interesting part when you watch it years later is actually the commercials commercials. yeah (laughs) exactly when those special editions came out i knew it was bad when in the in the first one, uh, in in a New Hope, they had the scene where Han Solo was talking to Jabba the Hutt. Oh my god! And they've put god. in. And granted, it was a scene that they filmed in the seventies, and they had just gone back and done. But they filmed it in the seventies <laughs> before they understood the character of Jabba the Hutt. Yeah. So it always begged the question: like, why is why is this guy who is essentially playing like Don Corleone? You know, he's the fucking Godfather of the mob. Why does he give a shit enough to get? To leave his nice palace and go talk to this, like, you know, third hand smuggler. And the thing uh, I hate, too, is they threw Boba Fett in the scene. Right. Which yeah. fucked up the chronology because Boba Fett wasn't actually supposed to be in, like, the Han Solo story yet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They made it like he always just hung around with Jabba, so I'm like, yeah, nothing okay. better to do. Okay, yeah. so, so rewind. Yeah. What is so crappy about the special editions or the spe- like the, the the redo? Like, okay, what's- here's my, okay. my biggest Luke, problem. Please tell me. My biggest problem uh, is wi- in in Return of the Jedi. Okay, uh, after they blow up the second Death Star and they have the celebration scene with the Ewoks, <laughs> the Force ghosts of Yoda, Obi Wan Kenobi, and Anakin appear in the special editions. They replace Anakin with Hayden Christensen. The guy who played Anakin in, in the, the prequels. prequels. Yeah. And at this point, like, by the time those had come out, I'd seen these movies so much that, like, these characters are, like, family to me. So yeah. it was like looking at a it's family Sebastian photograph. Sebastian Shaw was pissed. Right. Yeah. And so it was like looking at a family okay. photograph and being like, there's mom, yeah. there's dad, yeah. and there's Hayden Christensen. It's like, it's, <laughs> it's like if somebody said, like, if, it's like if, if like an, uh, 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 a Da Vinci or something come back to life, decided, I don't like the smile that I put on a Mona Lisa. Right. Photoshopped a toothy smile very obviously into the middle of it. <laughs> a wooden but, smile. Yeah, that's what it would, that's what these special editions are like. Okay, and those came 
came out like around. They came out like a couple. No, they came well, out a couple years before well, well, the prequels come out. Here's what happens, right? So you've got this original trilogy. First one comes out, uh, 1977. The second yeah. one, Empire Strikes Back, 1983. One, Return of the Jedi, 1983. They don't fuck with it until 1997 when mm-hmm. they re-release them. And when they re-release them, they digitally add in a bunch of stuff. And yeah. since 1997, George Lucas has not stopped fucking with these movies. Every single time they re-release them, he adds something egregious to them. Mm-hmm. You're just like, just leave it alone. It's great. Just leave it alone. Because the one that came out in 97 was the least offensive. Because they hadn't unleashed the prequels on the world yet. They had just... Oh, but they, they added in Jabba, right? right? They, they added the Jabba. Jabba thing in. And I was, was about to correct you to say Jabba was not in the first one, but yeah. then I remembered yeah, a special edition. Yeah, they added in that you know, weird you know scene. They even add stupid shit it doesn't need. Because you know how like at the end of Empire Strikes Back, Darth Vader's like, ready my ship. Or something right, like that. Yeah, yeah. And they actually take footage from the beginning of Return of the Jedi yeah, yeah. and put it in there. So now you see Vader's ship leaving yeah, and all like, that. Why? Why? Who get, but the the most the one where I, I knew that Lucas had lost his goddamn mind was uh they replaced Boba Fett's voice. And Boba Fett has a grand total of, I believe, three lines. And I think I can quote all of them. They are uh as you wish. Put Captain Solo in the cargo hold and ah! oh, you, forgot, you forgot the fourth. What's the fourth one? He's no good to me. He's dead. no good to me. Dead. That's right. So he had four lines, right? And they took the fucking douchebag who played, you know, Django the fucking Fett. fucking Maori guy. Right. They took him from the prequels and replaced Boba Fett. Because Boba Fett used to sound like a badass, and now he just sounds like, like a, a wine we- guy. Like a fucking weird New Zealand guy. You may take Captain Solo to Jabba the Hutt after I have Skywalker. He's no good to me dead. You may take Captain Solo to Jabba the Hutt after I have Skywalker. He's no good to me dead. Cause see, that's, that's what I'm saying. Star Wars went from being badass to fucking pussy shit. Yeah. There's no other way to put it. Absolutely. Pussy shit. Yeah. I remember terrible. in college, I spent probably three or four hours one day creating a fake Boba Fett Facebook profile. Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I you put in the you. research to do it. His his birthday uh, was the first time uh, he was ever, like, I believe it was the holiday special. Is that oh, right? Yeah, that's yeah, right. Is that yeah. the first time Star he was Wars ever seen? special. Yeah. Uh, so Which what was that, great. like, 78 or something like that? Yep, yeah. Christmas 78. Yep, so that that was his birthday. Uh, he was in a relationship, and it's complicated with Sintas Vel, which is very expanded universe. <laughs> <laughs> That's very expanded wow. universe. <laughs> For a while before that, though, he was in a relationship uh, with a fake profile created called First Name Hot Chick, Last Name Big Boobs, <laughs> was her name. I and, love those fake Facebook yeah. profiles. I had three of them. And, and the uh, profile picture was uh, Scarlett Johansson, and uh, there were a lot of Persian dudes that thought that was real. <laughs> there were a lot. I got a lot of creepy messages on that, and eventually Facebook <laughs> shut down my profile. <laughs> So wait, didn't you say you had the most at one point the most successful Boba Fett? Oh, I had the number one Boba Fett on Facebook. Yeah, uh, that's until awesome. I lost the password, and it had way more friends than my real profile <laughs> <laughs> by a lot. <laughs> All right, that's I don't know if I should admit this or not, but I had the most popular. You know, Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Yeah, yeah I yeah. had the most popular Eddie profile on MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> on MySpace. Yeah, just I was going back before. I. Uh, See, that's a thing that Facebook has completely eliminated with the um, with like the, the the likes pages, like the official likes pages, is the the art form of the fake Facebook profile oh, or yeah. the fake MySpace profile or the fake Friendster profile. That was that was an art form. I agree. I agree. Sure. I was inspired to create that Eddie one because I saw somebody had an Alf profile. I thought was funny. <laughs> I I had one on Friendster. Way back, that was the uh, one for D. Snyder. I had two. I had D. Snyder from Twisted Sister, and I had Super Macho Man from Mike Tyson's Punch Out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> D. Snyder one would get people writing these like long letters about how Twisted Sister changed their life, and it was scary because I was like, "Do I respond to this? Like, this person is opening up their soul to who they think is D. Snyder." <laughs> And it's not obviously D. Snyder, because I just put ridiculous stuff as his likes and interests. Right, right. But they were just like, oh, D. Snyder, like, Twisted Sister inspired me to understand that, you know, that the world is a certain way, so I came out to my parents as being gay. (laughs) 
And I was just like, how do I respond to that sort of thing? I'm just like an 18 year old shithead. So you know? super earnest about Twisted Sister. Yeah, I know. Nobody got, nobody did that with Super Macho Man. Nobody was like, oh, I beat Super Macho Man in Punch Out. And, yeah. Wasn't well, so he the one looked like Superstar Graham? Yeah, he was the one that was wearing the Speedo and yeah. had the mullet. Well, and said that, that junk hanging out, dude. I don't smoke. I don't smoke, but tonight I'm going to smoke you. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Twisted Sister, probably the best of the hair metal bands for my money. Twisted, I, yeah. I like rat. Rat's oh good. no, I mean the closest to art was Stay Hungry. Yeah, okay. It's got burning hell. It's got that horror terrier thing. It's got we we're not going to take it, which I thought was cool till I found out it was just Oh Come O Ye Faithful. <laughs> it's got I Want to Rock, which was an MTV anthem back in the day. So <laughs> when people talk about heavy metal albums, I thought there's only one that's worth the shit, and that's Stay Hungry. <laughs> Original Trek is good stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't care for all the other series, like when it became a franchise, but Original Trek still does it for me from time to time. Well, I think the divide between Star Trek and Star Wars people is always that Star Trek is more traditionally science fiction in that. It's always been defined to me that science fiction is never actually a projection of the future. It's always a reflection of what's going on at the moment. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely. It's just pushing whatever's happening in society all the way to the end of it. It's That's from the beginning. So you can take Frankenstein, you can take the time machine, you can take whatever. And in that sense, Star Trek is, especially the original series, is a, is a commentary on the 60s. Yeah, and absolutely. Everything. I love it. That's, that's what I love about the original Star Trek. The other ones were so sissy. But the yeah. original Star Trek was like, we're on a planet where the men have to cook dinner for the yeah. women. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love it. The sexism of the original Star Trek is one of the things that makes it, as far as I'm concerned, awesome. <laughs> and But then Star Wars is, is seen by a lot of people as almost reactionary in that you have... You know, the class of the class of filmmakers that Lucas comes up with is mm-hmm. Coppola, it's Spielberg, it's Martin Scorsese, it's all these it's all these people who make these very challenging films throughout the seventies. And Lucas did too originally with THX eleven thirty eight. Yeah, that's and, a good and movie. Stuff like that. And but then you get towards the end of the seventies when Star Wars comes out and it's it's seen by a lot of people as, you know, Apocalypse Now is this movie that's, you know, it's really hard to figure out who the good guys are. Same with Taxi Driver. Same with The Godfather. It's all about these anti-heroes. And Lucas is almost making a stand against the people he kind of came up with with this movie that is all about black and white. Well, really, what it is, though, is, you know, it's really a pastiche to all, like, the westerns. Right. And, and the, you know, the... Uh, samurai ser- movies. Samurai movies and, the and like, the serialized adventures, right. science fiction and otherwise, that he grew up with. And I right. think that's kind of lost now. With the heavy component of Greek literature and, and biblical and literature. I swear to God, there will be a time a thousand years from now when the only uh, movie... Uh, from the 20th or 21st century that people can relate to is Star Wars. Yeah. Because it is such a... It might as well be the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's the yeah. Epic of Gilgamesh with like a, a technological setting. Yeah. And everything else, that every other movie you see, you have to be too acculturated to the times to understand. Right. But Star Wars is eternal because of that. So now, how many of the movies will you actually stand by, though? Well, the, Star Wars? Yeah. I am a firm believer. A lot of people like Empire Strikes Back best, and I love Empire Strikes Back. Uh-huh. But I firmly believe that A New Hope is the best one. It stands alone as a movie much better than the other two. It's the I'd complete agree. myth like That's that. That's true. I'd agree. And yeah. I will stand by that one. I'll stand by um, Empire, mm-hmm. and I'll stand by a Jedi, uh, although it's starting to lose a little bit by Jedi. Yeah. I will not go near the prequels. Jedi that, is that, the that one That's the with... very start of like the foreshadowing of what could come, like when the Ewoks yeah. start coming in. The Jabba part is the shit. Yeah. yeah. And there's even other things I don't like, like um, Mon Mothma and that shit. Sure. Where she's like, many Bothans died. died. And it's, it's like, what, <laughs> what the fuck is a Bothan? Who gives a shit? <laughs> you watch the first movie, they're just burning dead Jawas like it's nobody's <laughs> business. Luke's own uh, family is dead. He's like, oh, shit, this sucks. Man, I'm it gonna doesn't, get even cry. doesn't even cry. Yeah. They're just dead. He's like, ah, shit. Well, I'll go somewhere else. I, I guess I can get into the academy now. Yeah. <laughs> Jedi's the one with Billy D. Williams, right? Well, he's in M- he's, he's in the other one too. The, the he's the best part of both of those. He yeah. Sex. Well, Billy D. Billy D. Williams is the man. Yeah, Let me just tell you this: this if you want to have a good party, there's only two things you got to remember. Rule number one: always have a good supply of Colt forty five. <laughs> rule number two: don't forget rule number one. Hell yeah, baby! <laughs> <laughs> Colt forty five. It gets the job Colt done. Colt forty five. You know who I am. You know what I do. You know what I drink. Hell yeah, baby. 
Yeah, if I if I have to choose a, a character on 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 the rebellion, it's got to be Lando. Oh, what about Han? I take. I, I, the, oh the, man! I mean, I love Han Solo. I think Lando's slightly cooler. There's a certain point in your life when you reach like your mid twenties to early thirties, which is kind of a few years away from me. But you realize, like, I am Han Solo now. Yeah. And that's the prime of your life. And I tell you this, man, as soon as I figured I used to like Boba Fett as a kid. Yeah. And I liked Boba Fett before Boba Fett was cool. Yeah. But I get to the age and like, fuck, man, it's all about Han Solo. And, yeah. and it is. Han Solo is the man on the cusp of, of manhood but still has the the cynicism of youth. Han Solo is what it's all about, man. It really is. And I like him better with the jacket than with the vest, but that's just me. Yeah. Here's, here's what Lando has over Han Solo. Okay. Is his uh, weirdly Mexican little alien sidekick that he has. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they're flying oh, on uh, Return of the Jedi. Ne- no, 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 no. It was no, Nine Moon. Oh, Nine no. I hated that boy. <laughs> when I was a kid, I had his action figure. <laughs> I traded it for a bunch of markers and a go-bot. <laughs> that shows you what he ain't no Chewbacca, that I'm. I just loved his laugh a little. <laughs> <laughs> that blast came from the Death Star. Dude, do that. This face is a fucking triangle. What the fuck is that shit? <laughs> Luke, who's your who's your favorite Star Wars character? Oh, my favorite Star Wars character. Um. I mean, it can't be Luke Skywalker. It absolutely... Just because of all of the Luke Skywalker jokes yeah. through the years. Did you always okay. have to play as Luke when you were a kid in the schoolyard because of your name? Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, this is why I never got into Weezer. <laughs> <laughs> it's like being the only girl in the neighborhood and you're playing Ninja Turtles. You're yeah. stuck with April every yeah. fucking time. Yeah, that's true. Exactly. Uh, it was... God. F- yeah, for years. I think the most recent Luke Skywalker joke I've gotten is maybe like a week ago. You'd think it would die out eventually, but like yeah. it still happens. Still Luke. Oh, like Luke Skywalker. That's not even a joke. It's just, hey, you remember that thing yeah, everybody knows? Like, yo, no, like Luke the Drifter. <laughs> yeah, I get that all the time. My name. What? Luke the Drifter? Pat Riley. The Lakers oh, coach? Sure. Yeah, yeah, the Lakers oh. coach. I get that, too. Miami. When I tell people who I do this podcast with, I'm like, yeah, it's Mr. Goodnight and Pat Riley, the Lakers coach. I'm like, I don't follow basketball. It's weird. You know, it's one of those things that it. I go to open mics at, you know, clubs or something like that, and people are just like, ooh, the next open micer is the former coach of the Lakers. I'm like, oh, that's really original. I played soccer with a kid named Michael Jordan. <laughs> I had a teacher named Michael Jordan, too. <laughs> yeah. He was like a six foot six tall like white guy with a mustache like he was, so was probably, the kid I played soccer yeah with. he was pretty much the same height as michael jordan it was yeah. just like a the polar opposite of michael jordan essentially yeah when they would announce him at the beginning of soccer games he would laugh at his own name yeah and then serious by the Aaron pa- the alan parsons project would play <laughs> so wait what what was the what was your favorite character uh oh all i established is that it wasn't luke, it wasn't huh? luke yeah <laughs> <laughs> Oh uh, man! Is that your favorite gospel too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and my dad's name is Mark, so that was always. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. My favorite character. I don't know. Um, not Luke. Not Anakin. It narrows it down. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I know them Skywalkers. Yeah. Oh, by the way, like if they're trying to hide Luke, like after he's born, why did they let him keep his last name and send him to his family? Yeah, like yeah, that's yeah. bullshit. <laughs> the thing that gets me too is at one point it, in that continuum, he buys back his own fucking droid. Yeah. Oh, it, it yeah, yeah, yeah. His yeah. dad built it. Yeah. <laughs> and he knew and then, the droid because they introduced it in themselves before, and he who buys. Did he, back his who did he buy the droid from? The Jawas. The Jawas. Yeah. Okay. And why did he sell the droid? Uh, so it's a long it's, story. His, they get captured when they're like released in a. It's it's a long. Okay, chain that's. Of fine, I just yeah. caught this when I rewatched it. Is that the previous owner right before uh, Luke and Owen and Baru buy the droids? The previous owner right before that is Wedge Antilles. Yeah, he goes. I was the property of a Captain Antilles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so that's just tying everybody together in this yeah. unnecessary. Here, here comes the nerd. Uh, Captain Antilles is not Wedge Antilles. They're not related. He's not Jimmy Smith. <laughs> they're uh, they're. Captain, because at the time Wedge is just a fighter pilot. He hasn't been promoted. Oh, and he's not a captain he, yet. And he's not a captain yet, and he's not related to Captain Antilles. Captain Antilles is uh, is from Alderaan, 
and Wedge Antilles is from Karelia. So that's well, ridiculous. Like so, they, so they just yeah. make us like assume that Antilles is like the Smith last name. Or does it? It's like, so. like yeah, I guess it's just another Antilles. Star Wars became a bunch of dark shit like this, and that's why I, I do not forgive George Lucas. He shoved Boba Fett in a movie where he didn't belong. He made everybody in a, like a shit dork character all of a sudden. <laughs> my my friend Dave Grimaldi, who's not here right now, and he's not uh, related to the royal family of Monaco. <laughs> <laughs> but my friend Dave Grimaldi always said he wanted to make an anti-prequels website called he didn't build them dot com <laughs> saying that Darth Vader did not build three C three PO there. Because that, that, to me, was the biggest just dump on the legacy right. of, of the prequel, well, of the old trilogy. Because C-3PO is completely impractical in that situation. Yeah, like, it's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a, a diplomat droid. A butler. Yeah. I'm going to make a butler for my, for my mother who's a slave. Yeah. No, we got lots of that. That's yeah. not going to help her at all. Yeah, a junkyard slave, yeah, and I'm going to build a translator droid. Yeah. So, uh, he'll supply the boy, i supply the pod. The <laughs> we'll split the winnings 50-50, I think. Uh, <laughs> Wow. I can do a hell of a waddle uh, if anybody you, gave a shit. I wish that was. <laughs> I don't wish anybody gave a shit about that movie because I'd I be, I be making money off my waddle invitation. <laughs> it's a credit to your race. Oh, still didn't get to my still favorite didn't character. Get to yeah. it. Okay. This happens a lot here. Yeah. Um, let's see. Who's 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 consistent? Who's because there's always somebody. There's always some kind of downfall with them. Lando's uh-huh. pretty cool. Han's pretty cool. Jabba. Both of them. Jabba, yeah, he's he's consistent, if nothing yeah, else, yeah, yeah. as Chewbacca. long as we don't include the uh, edited yeah. in scene. What, yeah. Did, yeah. what? what Chewbacca. Chewbacca. Chewbacca? I mean, I already did kind of throw him under the bus for Ninoob, so <laughs> I don't know if I could choose him now. Um, How about that boy that looks like General Lee? Oh, in, in uh, General Dodona or something yeah, like that? Yeah, Jan Dodona. I think I'm going to have to go with Han Solo. It's Han Solo? Uh, Han Solo, yep. And uh, what sells me on Han Solo is the moment that sells everybody on Han Solo. I love you. I know. And that was that was Harrison Ford's idea, yeah, too. Yep, yeah. That was an ad lib on his part. All right, so do you like Han with the jacket or the vest? I'm big into that issue. <laughs> Ooh, jacket. <laughs> That's not a question I'd ever considered before. Well, I'm big into that one. Um, I'm a jacket man. I, I know the answer to this question. What? It's the indoor fatigues, man. No, that's when that, that long you know, duster. You kryptonite. He so he looked like, he looked like Inspector Gadget on a hunting trip. Is what he looked. Don't you know that kryptonite is fattening? Because when he comes out of that shit, he gained like twenty pounds. <laughs> 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 oh man, he's so bad in Return of the Jedi. That's one of the problems with Jedi. Han loses some of his nuts. Mm-hmm. It's that part where he's like, hey, it's me. And it, that's his <laughs> fucking thing now. Man. Yeah. It's like he's like, thank God he was indie. You know what I'm saying? Because that, he got the nuts back. Well, that might have been Indy. part of the problem, is that he was yeah. indie already at that point. And so. he's like, I don't care about Han Whatever. I'm already I'm in, I've already been the two most badass characters in yeah. film. And yeah. he was smart enough to get a personal trainer for Temple of Doom. Yeah, because he saw how chunky monkey he was. <laughs> when jacket, he, I mean, I should way. talk, but when he was, you know, in kryptonite, you don't get much exercise in there. I'll go with jacket. You go with jacket. I'll go yeah. with jacket go with because jacket. I'm just I'm not a vest guy in yeah. general. Like yeah. on anybody, like if anybody's gonna pull it off, it's gonna be Han. But like yeah. still, I still. I almost to a jacket, I'll bought go a vest jacket. just because it looked like Han's vest. You understand? Know, because I figured yeah. I could pull it off. I know the most tragic character in Star Wars, the mm-hmm. one I feel the worst for every time. Rancor Keeper. Oh, me too. Oh, he's oh, such a Rancor fucking sad, such a good oh, guy. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if y'all followed G.I. Joe, but he looked like a fat Zartan. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, uh, Okay, so Jabba the Hutt, I'm explaining this to Pat. Jabba okay. the Hutt has this monster that he keeps under the floor. <laughs> and when and when people... We when, know the name of it because 3CPO expository like goes, the Oh no, the it's rancor! The rancor. <laughs> right. So when you know Jabba is mad at somebody, there will be a trap door and they'll fall through the floor and they'll be eaten by the So monster. he's the gimp, essentially. No, not the gimp. <laughs> Why would he be the gimp? You don't, you're not fucking the rancor. <laughs> No, the Rancor is fucking you, dude. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're the gimp. The Rancor is, is uh, Zed, baby. Um, From Police Academy? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But uh, anyway, he'll drop your ass through the floor, and this monster comes out and eats you, right? Okay. So he drops Luke Skywalker. Spoiler alert. Drops Luke Skywalker through the floor. He lives. Spoiler Double alert spoiler. from 1983. <laughs> okay. Drops him through the floor, and then the monster comes out. Does to Mondale eat. win, too? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the monster comes out, and then Luke is able to kill the monster. But then, What does he look like? Uh, oh, it's hard to explain. I, look, he's blo- he has gigantic hands and tiny feet, and he's hunched over in just a mouth made of and giant. It's, it's huge. It's phlegmatic. like 20 feet tall. And 20 feet tall. Phlegmatic probably. as okay. all hell. Yeah, it just had just like stuff coming out of his mouth. So Luke manages to kill the thing, but when he kills it, they take him away, and now they're going to kill him for real. But then right – they could have cut the shot right there, but then this this sad guy comes out wearing like a little like – Cowl. Like a leather cowl. <laughs> <laughs> and he's going, ah! <laughs> and it's his like trainer. It was the guy who'd been training the Rancor to kill people for all these years, and he comes and out. Another and another guy comforts him, and too. another guy like, oh, it's okay. It's so sad. You'd think it'd come naturally to the Rancor. Like, I don't and, know why he needs a trainer. And yeah. he has that little bit of blood come out of his <laughs> nostril. Yeah, you remember that? Shit? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Rancor. I had the action figure of the Rancor. Badass man. Yeah, Badass. Man. Ooh, if I was gonna describe the Rancor to make somebody understand it that hadn't seen it, it's like uh, cave trip. Like in in Lord of the Rings, I've okay. never seen. Lord okay. of the Rings. I saw that coming. Never mind. <laughs> it's a good thing there's three of us because Pat would slam us into a locker right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Pat can slam me into a locker any time. We got the no. Oh. <laughs> you know who I felt bad for uh, in Return of the Jedi when they were out like on the, the like on the skiffs above the Sarlacc pit? Yeah. Uh, that weak way alien that they knock into the Sarlacc. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah he's because just doing his job. He's just doing, he's just his, doing his job, and yeah. now he's going to get digested for a thousand years. Yeah. yeah. Just surprise, for- surprise. I'm Lando in disguise. Remember that <laughs> shit when Lando was one of them boys? Yep. yep. Yeah. That was from an action figure commercial. <laughs> if you watch television on Saturday morning cartoons from like 1980 through 1983, every other fucking commercial <laughs> was for Star Wars. Star Wars. I Wars. Can't have Star Wars action figure. Return of the Jedi. The Rancor monster has trapped Luke Skywalker. Can he escape the Rancor's claws as the Rancor Keeper and Gamorrean Guard look on? Luke's only chance is a stake in the monster's jaw. Will he succeed or fall victim? Only you can decide with Star Wars toys. Yeah. Oh, man, the Rancor is scary. Yeah, yeah he was very badass. Scary. Oh, man. my God. I had his toy, Kenna. Thank you, Kenna Parker. <laughs> That's Ooh. horrifying. And it was like a puppet. It was like a puppet that was like... Yeah. Now they'd say green screen. Back then it was blue screen. Blue screen, yeah. yeah. And it looked real, uh, despite the matte lines, than like shit looks nowadays. Uh, wow. Do you guys know about... The toys, the toy situation when Star Wars came out. Yeah. That yeah. that Kenner was not prepared to deal with the volume. Nobody was. And so they just sent out an empty box to children saying that they could get their toys in yeah, well, like March or whatever. It wasn't. Lucas shopped the thing around at like a convention before the movie came out and nobody was interested except Kenner said, we might want to do something with this. And so then when Star Wars was the biggest thing in creation... They didn't have, uh, you know, enough. They, they weren't ready yet for the the Christmas rush that year. Yeah. So basically, it was Kenner. Uh, Kenner basically sold people an empty box, <laughs> saying like they sold like a coupon and you got like a, a a gift certificate for like the first five or seven or whatever figures it was. Yeah. That when they came out, and so like if you was a kid on Christmas, you'd open up, you get an empty box, and when they come out with Star Wars figures, you get them, boy. <laughs> and they actually Star Wars was so big then they actually managed to sell these things. Oh yeah. And if you still have like the empty box. Box like coupon and all that shit. It's worth a shit ton now. But those action figures, I got to tell you, man. If you grew up in the '80s, man, those things in the first half of the '80s were it was huge and all that shit. And then overnight, they they went out of fashion. My daddy used to always make fun of us, saying, "I spent all that money on that damn Ewok Village, and then you kids <laughs> stop playing with it. <laughs> you damn Transformers now." <laughs> That's crazy, like, the minor characters that got that got uh, action figures, though. Like, I remember watching the commercial for the, the Nian Noob action figure. Yeah. And they're being excited about it. It's Nian Noob and Zuckus. Yeah, yeah, and, like, all these droids and shit. Yeah. You had to go back in the movie and say, where the hell did this guy come from? Yeah. But oddly enough, the um the one guy who never got an action figure was one of the bigger guys. In it. it was the, um, uh, uh, a Peter Cushing character. Oh, uh, Grand Moff Tarkin. Grand Moff yeah. Tarkin. 
The closest thing was when they made like that Imperial Commander guy. He like, never got a. Uh... No, he never got one. They made one of those Imperial officers, and you could pretend like that was him, but they, he never got one. No. Like in the in the original run or in the original, original run? Okay. Run. And nowadays Later, there's so did. many. Yeah, they make yeah. every. My, my, my brother always jokes nowadays they make Han Solo with a mustache just because they <laughs> they make everything that was possibly in the movies and beyond now. But but the, consider <laughs> they made well no but it, like you gotta understand they made so many minor characters at the end of that. Story. You could you got like the Kenna toy, and you turn the package around, and by the time of Return of the Jedi, there was like more than a hundred figures, and they would be listed on the back of the box, and you'd go through them, you'd be like, I don't remember that guy, medical droid, who the fuck is that? Two one B. Yeah, who the fuck is EV eighty eight or whatever? And, and those bounty RG-88? hunters. Yeah, or no, who was the droid that was like, you know, I have need for you on the master sail barge? They made that one. I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah. The one where. That one, that's another character I feel bad for is where he's, he's, uh, turns the big trash can droid upside down and then yeah. they start grinding his feet. Seems fucked up that they allowed the droids to feel pain. Like, yeah. that yeah. doesn't seem necessary. <laughs> it's real sadistic. Just program that in there. I've read so four of the five uh, Douglas Adams Hitchhiker's books. I've read uh, all of them. Oh, yeah. Hitchhiker's no, great. Even though, you know, God bless me, you know, women, please don't listen to this part, but yeah, I've read all the fucking Hitchhiker's books. They're all, <laughs> and they're all fantastic. I'm not proud. I'm not proud. But the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy books are the, some of the funniest books I've ever read in my Let life. Let me oh, yeah. say this. I did not think, uh, taking the books aside, if you didn't know the books... The movie from two thousand and five was not that bad. I didn't. I didn't know that's the one with the most deaf. And, yeah, most uh, deaf. Martin, Martin yeah. Freeman. Yeah. yeah, I saw it a bunch of times, but I have an excuse because I was in grief at the time because my daddy had just died. But beyond that, uh, the movie was not too bad. Wait, Martin Freeman was in it. The the guy who plays the guy Bilbo? from the Office. Yeah, the guy really? from the Office. Yeah, he, wow. He yeah. plays uh, Arthur. Yeah. Oh, the Dan. okay. Yeah. And it had most deaf as Ford uh, Prefect. And uh, who, who was the guy that played Zaphod? He was good. Yeah, I can't. I the can't guy remember. from that movie Moon or whatever it is. I can't. I can't. Oh, from Moon? Sam, Sam Rockwell. Rockwell. Sam Rockwell. He was best part. Yep. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> I contribute one thing to this podcast. <laughs> Sam that's Rock- Sam Rockwell. He was best part. He really was. He was like Custa meets Elvis in it. And Goodnight probably learned a couple of things from him on that. But uh, he was a good part in that. Did you, did you see it? I've not seen the movie, no. Okay. Well, you seen any good ones lately that you can recommend? Uh, well, I mean, I, the one that everybody's seen, Gravity. Sure. You hadn't seen oh, it. Yeah. How was it? That was really good. It was really good. For the same reasons that Star Wars blew people's minds where it's like... It's not, it's not the plot. It's like, man, you have to see it in theaters in 3D, though. If you watch it at home, it's a waste of time because the I, plot's not that great. What I am looking forward to is when it comes out on DVD, they have a short film of when, not to spoil it, but when Cinder Bulk's character is talking to the Inuit guy through the uh, radio in the space capsule. Mm-hmm. They actually did a short where it is from the Inuit guy's point of view. So it's like some guy on a dog sled out in like the northern Yukon or something like that, and he gets this weird reception, and it's the discussion from his point of view and him trying to process it, and I really want to see that. It's The movie was great, but I want to yeah. see it from the direction of the guy that's like the Inuit guy that she talks to, because I wasn't, I wasn't sure what the guy's story was, because it was yeah. like a weird language that we didn't grasp. So it was that movie was absolutely amazing. Would you agree though that you have to see it in 3D in theaters? Uh, the thing is is that I can't do 3D because I wear glasses yeah. and the particular type of glasses that I wear are not conducive to 3D. Oh, so so it's like it this 3D? weird I did see it in 3D and it was like really contorted because I have like big plastic frame horn rim glasses. So when I put the 3D glasses on, it doesn't fit. Sure. So it's either kind of a compromise where it's like you see some it doesn't you see some of it where it's not 3D or you don't see the movie at all cuz you know you can't use your glasses I have so. the same problem cuz I see movies high so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it really affects with the 3D. I still don't know what goes on in Pacific Rim, but I enjoyed the shit out of it. <laughs> uh, when I when I went to go see Gravity, I remember it was like right at the beginning, you know, like uh, the, it, it's just like the void of space, and then you slowly like start seeing them like come in. Yeah. And, and this this guy sitting right in front of me doesn't say anything, but he's just looking up 
at the screen with his friend, and as soon as he sees him, he just points at the screen. As yeah. though just to himself, like, oh, yep, there it is. I see it. <laughs> like, I can confirm that we're not just going to stare at space for two hours. Yeah, I, the 3D was pretty good then, I take it. Yeah, the 3D was it actually was, very yeah, tasteful was, and very good. Because I'm a huge 2001 A Space Odyssey fan. Uh-huh. Yeah. So there's my th- there's my Why, sci-fi. Yeah, that, oh, movie, that movie's yeah. got to be I art. love 2001 A Space Odyssey. That movie Odyssey. has got to be art because it makes no sense at all. I, no, it I does it, make I think sense. It makes great sense. It makes perfect sense. No, I was still across in the Bronx Zoo, and there was never no 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 monkeys hitting peckeries with like with like uh, you know jawbones and shit like that. <laughs> yeah, but the not, thing was, was that that was us millions of years yeah. ago. So that's the whole thing. Like the whole premise of 2001: A Space Odyssey is that some extraterrestrial life or God, or God, yeah, created this pillar, this monolith. They were evolutionary catalyst. Exactly. Right, and right. what is the thing that got the motion going to turn humans, you know, turn apes into humans? It well, it was basically tool making. Mm-hmm. Tool making, and tool making came when God came, well, or when fair, extraterrestrials, uh, some right. force fair outside enough. of us. Fair enough, Big Data. But spoiler alert: Why come boy turns into like star baby fetus when he's in some baroque? Because of, he got because he confronted bedroom at the end. Here's the thing: He confronted truth, and the truth basically took him outside of being a human being into being reborn. See, the weird thing about that was: Yeah, did you figure it out yourself? Or yes, did you read that somewhere. I, that's that's yeah. my theory. You were smart motherfucker so the thing is the thing is is that the one thing about the the monolith that always creeps me out is when it goes well the thing is is when when when, the shit out of frank pool is going into the monolith and they have all those colors that's the point where you drop acid we'll get high Fall asleep. <laughs> fall asleep. People. Most people fall asleep. Most people do. Well, I fell asleep. I was kind of high. Yeah. But, yeah, but when problem. it comes in, it's like all the colors. And then they had the freeze frames of like his face all like weird shaped. Yeah. That always creeped me out. Like, I don't know why Stanley Kubrick did that. The fucking yeah. monolith kind of singing and that thing scared the flying fuck yeah. out of me as a kid. But, yeah, no, I always uh, I always was a big fan of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Well, I think, yeah. it's, best, I think it's the most artistic we've ever made. Because, like I said, it does not make a lick of sense until now. Well, the, I think it makes the, sense. the reading that I'd always had of it, because the first the first monolith is appears before the, now, the apes. The second one is on the moon, and the third one is on in the, in the uh, book. It's in Saturn, but it was too expensive to do the rings so they, they changed Jupiter, it to Jupiter yeah. so it's I've like I've never read the books or it's like w- right? it's a book yeah Arthur C. Yeah, Clarke yeah, yeah. Uh, wrote it with Coob. they they co-wrote uh, with the Coob a, a novelization what happened you wrote it with yeah. the Coob right but in the in the original text, it's they go to Saturn, but then uh, it was like I said, too expensive to do. Well, rings. Doesn't really matter. Yeah, you so know, they Oklahoma made Jupiter or Arizona. What doesn't matter? <laughs> but the reading I'd always have was that these these monoliths were placed in different. Uh, in different places, possibly all at once, so that, you know, the idea was like, all right, so the first monolith happens, it creates mankind, so as soon as they get to the moon, they're going to find the next one, and that'll give them the next evolutionary step. So the star child being coming back in the star end is, is the new, you know, is the new next next step in man's evolution. Yeah, you know? yeah. What my feeling about that was, was that um, it was either the direction you were talking about, or it was places in which humanity should be. Everybody assumed that the moon could support life, yeah. and that the moon was essentially a dead planet. Yeah. Um, so the the monolith worked there, but some sort of life did not exist there. Some sort of um, advanced life didn't exist there. So that's why it was buried. And Jupiter, there, there's the moons of Jupiter, like Ganymede and Io and yeah. stuff like that. And you that see are, it, they say, that are very large, life. that yeah. have... Like liquid ice on there, yeah, like I, water ice EO. on there, yeah, yeah. So the whole thing the was observatory too. Yeah. So mm-hmm. the whole thing was was that I always read it as places where humanity should be, uh-huh. or that humanity had been, yeah, and they had existed. And the whole idea was that the next step was you know the moons of Jupiter as being the place to be. Yeah. Have you watched Room Two Thirty Seven? I haven't. No. The the documentary about The Shining. But it's not even about The Shining. It's about all of the theories that have popped up around the the ultimate, like, the meaning of The Shining. And one of them is that The Shining is Stanley Kubrick confessing to staging the moon landing with the government. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, the Ooh, only person stand. that I would earnestly believe believes that the moon landing was staged 
is like a redneck grandmother. Because I've met redneck grandmothers <laughs> that think that the moon landing is staged. Usually when it's like some random dude, I think it's just a, a thing of affect where they're like, oh, I got to show that I, you know, am outside the well, mainstream. I, Less to Hill? To, to his credit, this uh, this guy says, he goes, I'm not saying we didn't land on the moon. I'm saying what you saw was fake. And I was like, mm. I don't think that's true, but it, it sounds more reasonable. And this whole argument is basically that 2001 A Space Odyssey was basically the, the, his excuse. Mm-hmm. Because the movie comes out in 1968, Moon Landing is a year later. And, yeah. and the, the whole thing was like he was building all this shit and making this movie so that it wouldn't seem weird when he came out with the technology to actually to fake the moon landing. Anyway. Would, he, would he say that in front of Buzz Aldrin, though? No, no say he, that he doesn't you. have he doesn't have the spine. Would he say that in front of Buzz Lightyear? He'll, That's what I want to know. Because Buzz would knock him out. Well, I was gonna say Buzz Aldrin would knock you the fuck out. Buzz yeah. Lightyear has a laser too. <laughs> Buzz Aldrin's ninety three years old and he can still deliver a good uppercut. <laughs> District nine. Seen it, love it, love it. Yep. Are you uh, you like the Africana aspects of it, or what do we like about it? I liked that it wasn't a movie that I'd seen before. That's a fact. That's yeah. certainly something that you don't come across every day. Yeah. It also Although, gave us like a little bit of a social context of post-apartheid uh, South Africa, which is something I really don't think outsiders understand very well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was like uh, to to have that story, but even. Even his follow-up new movie, Neil Blomkamp's follow-up movie, was, uh, what was it called? Elysium? Elysium. Was, uh, not nearly as good as, good. as District 9. Um, I mean, neither movie has that much subtlety in it, but it's just because District 9 with Apartheid was a story that we're not as familiar with rather than, you know, whatever, you know, universal health care and that sort of yeah. stuff and the, the wealth gap and you know, the heavy-handed stuff that he did with that in Elysium was yeah. more like, okay, yeah, we, we also had a born it, in Vickers Vandom U, which was very... Vandomerva? Like, was that how it was yeah. pronounced? Yeah, very sort of Afrikaans. Vickers Vandomerva. Very sort of Afrikaans. Uh, the aspect of that movie I loved was that the aliens show up, and v- they look just as menacing as any alien invasion force you've ever seen, and then they go up there, and they're all, like, sick and dying. Like, I was like, that's such a cool... Yeah, and his name is Christopher Johnson or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Sci-fi greatest hits for you, your favorites, the ones that have just made impress, made you what you are, Dada, made you Luke. Okay, um, I guess we've got to start with Star Wars and Empire. I don't know if I can. I mean, I'll put Return of the Jedi in there. Return of the it's, Jedi. It's mm-hmm. not my favorite anymore, but when I was a kid, well, I, 1983. It was my yeah, it was shit when, kicking. When, when, well, I, when I was yeah. a kid, I loved it. I and loved the Ewoks. I was on board with their. It's not even their. It, uh, I, I loved log it. shenanigans. I loved it because it has the B wing, which is my favorite. B wing is badass. Yeah, I love the B wing. <laughs> also, the most just uh, the inappropriately scouts. designed. Yeah. Fighter. Yeah. I mean, most of them are. You know. Most of them are. Most of them are just terribly designed. <laughs> Uh, right up there with the AT-AT, which is the highest center of gravity yeah, well, yeah, possible. Yeah. Well, that thing was badass, <laughs> yeah. though. Let's just face yeah. that fact, you understand? Know, yeah. Oh, my God. With a general who looks like Stang commanding it. No, oh, General true. Veers. Yeah. yeah. And we had an endless discussion, me and our friend Jay Garrett, over whether or not that was General Veers or was that the guy whose action figure was called Adat Commander. <laughs> And it's General Vias. I was yeah. right. And then back to your classical references. That's uh, that's that's your that's your Hannibal. Those there you are, go. Those are exactly. Exactly. That's what that's supposed Except to be. Except two eyes. You understand? That's right. I'd put District Nine in there. Um, not Elysium. Uh, never. <laughs> yeah. Never saw. Oh, by the way, with with Elysium and like with with uh, God, what's that guy's name? Uh, the actor who plays Vicus Vandermerva. Oh yeah, well, uh, he was in like that A Team movie. Yeah, it's you know. it's like the he's man, an Afrikaners that, guy. That that South African accent is so different than you know. Oh, so you know it's it like there's two countries that aren't real countries, so they have an ambiguous accent. Uh-huh. It's South Africa and Israel because uh-huh. it's two countries that are put in a place they shouldn't be. So they have this sort of like mid European accent, which yeah. just does not make sense and sounds kind of English, kind of German. Yeah, where it's like there's 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 scenes. Like just watching him, where it's like, I 
I don't think you're a bad actor. I think you're a good actor, but it's hard for me to take it seriously with this <laughs> accent. You know? I didn't come to clicks, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're just a little gangster, or whatever. I, when he says the word gangster in Elysium, I just couldn't, like... Well, that's the thing. Well, Vickers was kind of a comedic character at the same yeah. time, but I guess he's stone cold, like, serious in Elysium. Yeah, yeah, he's supposed to be, like, just, like, this stone cold killer mercenary and with a South African accent. When there's no other South African people, so there's not context We're for We're far it. away from the bow war at this point. Yeah. You know what I'm my favorite class that I took in college was called Science Fiction as Intellectual History. It was fucking awesome. We just read ten science fiction books in, in chronological order and then, of course, like discussed what was going on at the time when they were written. And uh, one of my f- just favorite moments in life, and in order to imagine this, the guy who taught this class, just if you drew a cartoon of the most stereotypical college professor, it would be this guy, just white hair, white beard, Perfect, like, male pattern baldness, corduroy jacket with the elbow patches. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Little tiny glasses, perfect. Like Pat, essentially, in, in 10 years. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And uh, so... Point your tongue, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being inclusive. And uh, so we're, we're talking about uh, Frankenstein, which is... Frankenstein. Beautiful. The first science yeah. fiction book. And I had said this on... I uh, uh, did Andy Sell's podcast and talked about Frankenstein. And I was like, it's... It has to be the first science fiction book because science had just been invented. Science! <laughs> like, yeah, pretty much. Uh, at the turn of the 18, uh, 1800s. Uh, but anyway, we're talking about Frankenstein and we're talking about the fact that the uh, subtitle of Frankenstein is The Modern Prometheus. And this professor goes, uh, now if you recall, Prometheus stole fire from the gods. And the, f- and the fire of knowledge can light the world, but it can also hurt you very badly. I believe it was Richard Pryor who once said, when the fire hits your ass, you sober up quick. <laughs> like, just the whitest man you can imagine quoting Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor also said that being on stage is better than making love. And I'm like, Richard Pryor, you've taken way too much fucking coke. <laughs> Good night. What's your, uh, what's, what's your, uh, your top, top sci-fi? Uh, you know, I'm going to go with Star Wars 2, but just for the sake of differentness, I grew up, I was weaned on Planet of the Apes. You on Planet of the Apes, yeah. which is outstanding. General Ursus, probably one of the biggest uh, uh, military influences on me. Uh, <laughs> you, wonder, man. You, you, know, you know what I'm talking about, General Ursus, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> we must invade, invade. He's not going to say it a third time, is he? Invade. <laughs> I mean, that's good shit, you understand. General Ursus, what is it? <laughs> His leather pharaoh's helmet and his just gorilla nose, you understand. He is a great man. Uh, and yeah, Planet Apes. Oh, 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 oh. Sorry, my favorite movie of all time is science fiction. What's that? Omega Man. Oh, with Charlton Heston. Oh, yeah. You are going to see, you know how many times I've seen that movie? How many? Thousands. Thousands. Do you know the part, <laughs> of you know the part where, where, where Charlton Heston is like in a theater? Uh, by himself and watching the movie Woodstock and yeah. he's seen it yeah. so many times he can repeat it. Yeah. I have done an infinite regression thing where I'm repeating it along with Charlton Heston <laughs> repeating it. I've seen Omega Man so many times. I used to just like the Omega Man. You know how he gets home and he says, hi, another day, another dollar. And he ha- he has the bust of Julius Caesar and all yeah, that. Yeah. You're a move, Imperator. And he turns like the, <laughs> the, the security cameras on from outside. I used to get home and I would turn on a tape of the Omega Man as soon as I got in the house. So I basically was the Omega Man, you understand. I still am, you understand. I guess Pat has to be 2001. 2001 or uh, Space is the Place. What is Space is the Place? Space is the Place. place. Space is the Place is... It's a movie that was done and stars... Sun Ra. This is Jimmy Fay, Channel 5 Stone Child. As you are probably aware, several local mystics have predicted a landing from space this afternoon in the person of a black musician and thinker named Sun Ra. He's reputed to have been traveling in outer space all this time with his intergalactic mid-signed solar orchestra. And upon landing, he will reveal to the world his so-called plan for the salvation of the black race. This is incredible. I can't believe it. It's really happening. Yeah. Sun Ra had a Black Power science fiction movie uh-huh. that was absolutely amazing, where he travels through time and determines the fate of <laughs> African Americans. Okay. Uh, African Americans move to another planet, so they go into space, and he wears... He wears the greatest outfits yeah, ever. Yeah. Just the gold lame robes and this amazing... Head pe- it was like this headpiece that he wore that 
is I'd have to say it's probably about six foot tall. <laughs> I don't know how he balanced it. It looked like some sort of Dogon mask, and it is it's absolutely amazing. <laughs> and the sp- and the soundtrack of it is fantastic. So Space is the place. Is just was there a message to why it was only African Americans who went into? Well, it was a. It was kind of. And a, was it only African Americans? It was. Or an, all it was kind of people? a. Yeah. Well, it was all <laughs> black people. It was released, I think, in like seventy one or seventy two or something like that. So it was part of like the Black Power movement. Sure. So it was. It was kind of almost like a weird sort of parable for for. It's like black what, nationalism. What Parliament would ultimately become? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it was kind of an outgrowth of you know space is the uh, place, and black then the mother. Right? Yeah, it was the called? mothership would come down from the planet that they came from. You know, the the moon of Saturn right, from which right. they came from. But yeah, uh, Sun Ra is absolutely awesome. Yep, he's the most ridiculous human being to ever walk the earth. The music is different here. The vibrations are different. Not like Planet Rave. Planet Rave's sound of guns, anger, frustration. There was no one to talk to from Planet Rave, you understand. We set up a colony for black people here. See what they can do on the planet all their own without any white people there. We bring them here through either isotope, teleportation, transmolecularization, or better still, Teleport the whole planet here through music. I have a limited frame of knowledge. Yeah. My knowledge of Star Wars is is from two directions. One from Muppet Babies. They make our dreams come true. Yeah. It, it, all I know is that Darth Vader scares the crap out of Gonzo when he opens <laughs> that closet door. The I hope other the second one is Ewok Adventures. <laughs> <laughs> Ewoks are pretty cute. The other one was um, was just all the negativity that came out of and all the all the kind of there was a thing where samuel L. jackson parodied himself as mace windu uh-huh. and that was my my reference to like the prequels o- outside of everybody just hating the hell the prequels out. he just ate shit there's no other way to play it. i have a my, my the way in which i'm gonna watch star wars i'm gonna eventually watch star wars don't ever watch the prequels i'm Please. gonna watch the prequels first oh i'm gonna watch the prequels first oh. As George Lucas had designed me to. <laughs> all right, I'm going to have to admit something. The only good thing in the prequels, Camino. Okay, that's all we have to say. The the, water the rain planet? planet. I have often fantasized living on that planet with clone sex slaves. <laughs> it, that's another story for another time. Here's what I never understood: How is 150,000 clones like a big intergalactic army? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> for an yeah, entire day. Day. Get Galaxy. them little baby clones out of the light bulbs. Make them clones. That's what I don't understand. <laughs> There's 150,000 people in like a lot of armies. Ours, yeah, I know. I that's like the Army yeah. of the Potomac or something like that. And that's 19th century standards. Yeah, for I know. Sake. He could have just made up a bigger number. They didn't yeah, even have to whole, change any. That's scenes. the. Mo- that's, it's, I that's know like, it's the galactic. That's the, it like that's ten billion. And soldiers and you know, clone army, and that would that would do perfectly yeah, fine. Yeah. They wouldn't have had to show 000. us anymore. They could have showed us the same number. And just and it's all the same more. Hawaiian guy as it is. Yeah, yeah. Under- they should have got one of them Samoans because they would have big motherfuckers in that army. That <laughs> rivers you. If we're not, if we're excluding, uh, if we're excluding Star Wars. Well, once again, my answer is Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park's good. Enough. You, you, your 1993 is showing rivers. No, that's, that's my always my answer for everything, and it's 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 you know. Did you read the book? Remember when the book was like you know hot what, shit at the supermarkets? You know what? I made my father read the book to me when oh. I was in first grade because Did, I tried. Accompaniment of a liar, like Homer or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, like when I was, I tried, uh, I tried reading it, but I was in first grade and like. Half that shit didn't make sense. So I was like, hey, Dad, could you just start? So yeah, yeah. And I think he, I think he read the entire book to me, uh, which now, you know, and I went back and looked at it later. I was like, wow, that's good. Dad. That's a good, good dad. dad there. Does Jesus. anybody else have a favorite piece of literary science fiction? It's Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Oh. Uh, I'm also fond of uh, oh, a Canticle for Leibowitz. Have you never ever read, read that? that? No, what is that? Walter Miller is the guy's name, and uh, he was involved in the Battle of Monte Cassino in Italy and oh, watched shit. the watched the Abbey burn. They should have like, never done that because right. that was historically priceless. Exactly. So he watched all these monks and civilians and helpless people be burned alive, you know, and he mm. was partially responsible because he was in one of the armies that were just shelling over this mountain, right? And uh, 
always felt real bad about it and then wrote this book based on it, which in the course of the book, I believe the apocalypse happens eight times and it takes place over the course of like 8,000 years and it just keeps happening over and over. And so it's a very nihilistic book, but it's very funny in its nihilism. Gotta read that. It's very good. Sounds kind of vomit. And then the guy published it and then, you know, put a bullet in his head, you know, so yeah. It's, well, it's the war will one. do that to you. Don't, I mean, don't fuck around. Oh, hell yeah. But I yeah. mean, that's the whole point of, uh, what's it called there? Uh, Schlatter, Schlachter 5th there, Slaughterhouse 5. Slaughterhouse 5. You gotta escape in a damn world of like, uh, of just fantasy, otherwise you're gonna put a bullet in your head that's when you right. go through that. I like the Time Machine by H.G. Wells. Very good. I like that right. one. And my favorite sci-fi song is Telstar by the Tornadoes. Oh, perfect. I, I'd go, I'd go, uh, I don't know, Mothership Connection. Oh, well, the Mothership Connection, I mean, that's without saying. The entire Parliament <laughs> the whole, the whole discography. Is the best science fiction. That's the best science fiction ever. That's my, if, so, all sides, if Star Wars was <laughs> George, George Clinton, Clinton and Bootsy and Star Child and all those people like yeah. that, Sir, Noe's devo- Sir Noe's Devoid of Funk, <laughs> I would watch Star Wars if that was, if that was the cast of Star Wars. Are you going to catch up before the new ones come out? Oh, my God. Yeah, you got two no, years. No, I want to wait till. All of them are out. Like they're all never going to stop coming out, Pat. They're never going to stop. So you're, I'm going to be seventy. You're going to be dead, and Star Wars is still going to be. coming I'm going to be seventy, and I'll watch all forty-seven of them in a row. Because <laughs> I'm a some man. Some of them will be good at that point. Yeah. <laughs> well, it might turn into a Fast and the Furious situation where there's like a lull. It's got Vin Diesel. Yeah, and then it. all of a sudden they're just all Fast and the Furious. Self-aware and amazing. It's so fantastic. It's so yeah. that's a good science fiction yeah. movie. <laughs> yeah. None of that is possible. Yeah. None of it. <laughs> <laughs> Vin Diesel in a good movie? That's yeah. not possible. Well, and the thing is, the movie series needed him, because the second one they did without him, you think, oh, Vin Diesel can't act. Then you watch one without him, it's like, no, this needs Vin Diesel. Yeah, no, it Gravitas. needs Vin Diesel. Yeah. How many and of them then you put The Diesel? Rock in there? Fuck. At least one. At least one. Fuck, fuck The Rock. Too, yeah, but the I remember one. Too Fast, Too Furious, Sans Diesel, Tokyo Drift, Sans Diesel. Yeah, even a yeah. Dodge Charger can't so, save that movie. Yeah. That's saying a lot. So there's two of them. Actually, take that back. Uh, Tokyo Drift, and I... I can't believe we discussed this uh, in conversation. The end of Tokyo Drift, Vin Diesel shows up in drag races, like the post credit scenes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right at the end. So, But I mean, the whole movie, he's not in it, the whole movie. Right, so technically he's... Uh, Tokyo D- Drift does yeah, have like one Gip- of my favorite yeah. movie lines of all time, Like Gip Stewart at Gettysburg, he shows up right at the end. Uh, yeah. Which is in the opening race, uh, when that, like, the jock guy and, like, whatever he's driving, his, his muscle car, he's driving, he's racing against whatever the main character is who's not Vin Diesel and like that guy's girlfriend is with him and he loses the race and and the girlfriend just turns to him and says I thought you loved me <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as I saw that line I was like I don't care if Vin Diesel's not in this I love this movie already I'm on board for this movie cool. and then they just got better when Vin Diesel and The Rock <laughs> came in uh, The Rock will make any movie good I don't yeah. like the fucking Rock man I never thought he was not a good wrestler oh, you know not what, a good actor you know what he did not make good is Southland Tales I never saw that it's a real that pile was, of trash hey real he real made bad. the tooth fairy good so <laughs> It's tough to be the rock. Oh, oh, yes. No, no, shut your mouth. No, no. It really is. Oh, yes. Even though the rock is the rock is the most electrifying man in all of showbiz. Oh, yes. You see, when the rock gets too much, too much of the fame and, and all the bright lights, he likes to kick back and have a slight. No, 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 no. The rock is gonna eat the whole. Luke, where can people find you online? At Luke F. Jensen on Twitter. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. The Goods from the Woods is mixed and edited by me, Rivers Langley, and distributed by Westcast Network. Our theme song is composed by DJ Smiles. You can find him online at djsmiles.net. 